Book 12. Sea Perils and Defeat. The ship sailed on, out of the ocean stream, riding a long swell on the open sea for the island of Aiaia. Summering dawn has dancing grounds there, and the sun has rising, but still by night we beached on a sand shelf and waited in beyond the line of breakers to fall asleep, awaiting the day star. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose made heaven bright, I sent shipmates to bring Elpinor's body from the house of Kirk. We others cut down timber on the foreland, on a high point, and built his pyre of logs, then stood by weeping while the flame burnt through course and equipment. Then we heaped his barrow, lifting a gravestone on the mound, and fixed his light, but unwarped or against the sky. These were a rites in memory of him. Soon, then, knowing us back from the dark land, Kirk came freshly adorned for us, with handmaids bearing loaves, roast meats, and ruby-colored wine. She stood among us in immortal beauty jesting, hearts of oak, did you go down alive into the homes of death? One visit finishes all men but yourselves, twice mortal. Come. Here is meat and wine, enjoy your feasting for one whole day, and in the dawn tomorrow you shall put out to sea. Sailing directions, landmarks, perils, I shall sketch for you, to keep you from being caught by land or water in some black sack of trouble. In high humor and ready for carousal, we agreed, so all that day until the sun went down we feasted on roast meat and good red wine, till after sunset, at the fall of night, the men dropped off to sleep by the stern hawsers. She took my hand then, silent in the hush, drew me apart, made me sit down, and lay beside me, softly questioning, as I told all I had seen, from first to last. Then said the Lady Kirk, so, all those trials are over. Listen with care to this, now, and a god will arm your mind. Square in your ship's path are sirens, crying beauty to bewitch men coasting by, woe to the innocent who hears that sound. He will not see his lady nor his children in joy. Crowding about him, home from sea, the sirens will sing his mind away on their sweet meadow lolling. There are bones of dead men rotting in a pile beside them, and flayed skins shrivel around the spot. Steer wide, keep well to seaward, plug your oarsman's ears with beeswax kneaded soft, none of the rest should hear that song. But if you wish to listen, let the men tie you in the lugger, hand and foot back to the mast, lash to the mast, so you may hear those harpies thrilling voices, shout as you will, begging to be untied, your crew must only twist more line around you and keep their stroke up, till the singers fade. What then? One of two courses you may take, and you yourself must weigh them. I shall not plan the whole action for you now, but only tell you of both. Ahead are beetling rocks and dark blue glancing amphitrite, surging, roars around them. Prowling rocks, or drifters, the gods in bliss have named them, named them well. Not even birds can pass them by, not even the timorous doves that bear ambrosia to Father Zeus, caught by downdrafts, they die on rock wall smooth as ice. Each time, the father wafts a new courier to make up his crew. Still less can ships get serum of these drifters, whose boiling surf, under high fiery winds, carries tossing wreckage of ships and men. Only one ocean, going craft, the far, famed Argo, made it, sailing from Aida, but she too, would have crashed on the big rocks if Hera had not pulled her through, for love of Ison, her captain. A second course lies between headlands. One is a sharp mountain piercing the sky, with storm cloud round the peak dissolving never, not in the brightest summer, to show heaven's azure there, nor in the fall. No mortal man could scale it, nor so much as land there, not with twenty hands and feet, so sheer the cliffs are, as of polished stone. Midway that height, a cavern full of mist opens toward Erebos and evening. Skirting this in the lugger, great Odysseus, your master bowman, shooting from the deck, would come short of the cave mouth with his shaft, but that is the den of Scylla, where she yaps abominably, a newborn whelps cry, though she is huge and monstrous. God or man, no one could look on her in joy. Her legs, and there are twelve, are like great tentacles, unjointed, and upon her serpent necks are borne six heads like nightmares of ferocity, with triple serried rows of fangs and deep gullets of black death. Half her length, she sways her heads in air, outside her horrid cleft, hunting the sea around that promontory for dolphins, dogfish, or what bigger game thundering Amphitrite. Feeds in thousands. And no ship's company can claim to have passed her without loss and grief, she takes, from every ship, one man for every gullet. 
The opposite point seems more a tongue of land you'd touch with a good bowshot, at the narrows. A great wild fig, a shaggy mass of leaves, grows on it, and Charybdis lurks below to swallow down the dark sea tide. Three times from dawn to dusk she spews it up and sucks it down again three times, a whirling maelstrom, if you come upon her then the god who makes earth tremble could not save you. No, hug the cliff of Scylla, take your ship through on a racing stroke. Better to mourn six men than lose them all, and the ship too. So her advice ran, but I faced her, saying, only instruct me, goddess, if you will, how, if possible, can I pass Charybdis or fight off Scylla when she raids my crew? Swiftly that. Loveliest goddess answered me, must you have battle in your heart forever? The bloody toil of combat? Old contender, will you not yield to the immortal gods? That nightmare. Cannot die, being eternal evil itself, horror and pain and chaos, there is no fighting her, no power can fight her, all that avails is flight. Lose headway there along that rock face while you break out arms, and she'll swoop over you, I fear, once more, taking one man again for every gullet. No, no, put all your backs into it, row on, invoke blind force, that bore this scourge of men, to keep her from a second strike against you. Then you will coast Thrinachia, the island where Helios cattle graze, fine herds, and flocks of goodly sheep. The herds and flocks are seven, with fifty beasts in each. No lambs are dropped, or calves, and these fat cattle never die. Immortal, too, their cowherds are, their shepherds, Phaethausa and Lampicia, sweetly braided nymphs that divine Nyera bore to the overlord of high noon, Helios. These nymphs their gentle mother bred and placed upon Thrinachia, the distant land, in care of flocks and cattle for their father. Now give those kind a wide berth, keep your thoughts intent upon your course for home, and hard seafaring brings you all to Ithaca. But if you raid the beeves, I see destruction for ship and crew. Rough years then lie between you and your homecoming, alone and old, the one survivor, all companions lost. As Kirk spoke, Dawn mounted her golden throne, and on the first rays Kirk left me, taking her way like a great goddess up the island. I made straight for the ship, roused up the men to get aboard and cast off at the stern. They scrambled to their places by the rowlocks, and all in line dipped oars in the grey sea. But soon and off, shore breeze blew to our liking, a canvas, bellying breeze, a lusty shipmate sent by the singing nymph with sunbright hair. So we made fast the braces, and we rested, letting the wind and steersmen work the ship. The crew being now silent before me, I addressed them, sore at heart, dear friends, more than one man, or two, should know those things Kirk foresaw for us and shared. With me, so let me tell her forecast, then we die with our eyes open if we are going to die, or know what death we baffle if we can. Sirens weaving a haunting song over the sea we are to shun, she said, and their green shore all sweet with clover, yet she urged that I alone should listen to their song. Therefore you are to tie me up, tight as a splint, erect along the mast, lashed to the mast, and if I shout and beg to be untied, take more turns of the rope to muff me. I rather dwelt on this part of the forecast, while our good ship made time, bound outward down the wind for the strange island of Sirens. Then all at once the wind fell, and a calm came over all the sea, as though some power lulled the swell. The crew were on their feet briskly, to furl the sail and stow it, then, each in place, they poised the smooth, or blades, and sent the white foam scudding by. I carved a massive cake of beeswax into bits and rolled them in my hands until they softened, no long task, for a burning heat came down from Helios, lord of high noon. Going forward I carried wax along the line, and laid it thick on their ears. They tied me up, then, plumb amidships, back to the mast, lashed to the mast, and took themselves again to rowing. Soon, as we came smartly within hailing distance, the two sirens, noting our fast ship off their point, made ready, and they sang, this way, O oh, turn your bows, Achaia's glory, as all the world allows, more and be merry. Sweet coupled airs we sing. No lonely seafarer holds clear of entering our green mirror. Pleased by each purling note like honey twining from her throat and my throat, who lies a pining. Sea rovers here take joy voyaging onward, as from our song of Troy Greybeard and rower, boy goeth more learned. All feats on that great field in the long warfare, dark days the bright gods willed, wounds you bore there, Argo's old soldiery on Troy beach teeming, 
charmed out of time we see. No life on earth can be hid from our dreaming. The lovely voices in ardor appealing over the water made me crave to listen, and I tried to say untie me, to the crew, jerking my brows, but they bent steady to the oars. Then Paramedes got to his feet, he and Eurylocos, and passed more line about, to hold me still. So all rode on, until the sirens dropped under the sea rim, and their singing dwindled away. My faithful company rested on their oars now, peeling off the wax that I had laid thick on their ears, then set me free. But scarcely had that island faded in blue air than I saw smoke and white water, with sound of waves and tumult, a sound the men heard, and it terrified them. Oars flew from their hands, the blades went knocking wild alongside till the ship lost way, with no oar blades to drive her through the water. Well, I walked up and down from bow to stern, trying to put heart into them, standing over every oarsman, saying gently, friends, have we never been in danger before this? More fearsome, is it now, than when the Kiklops penned us in his cave? What power he had! Did I not keep my nerve and use my wits to find a way out for us? Now I say by hook or crook this peril too shall be something that we remember. Heads up, lads. We must obey the orders as I give them. Get the oar shafts in your hands, and lay back hard on your benches, hit these breaking seas. Zeus help us pull away before we founder. You at the tiller, listen, and take in all that I say, the rudders are your duty, keep her out of the combers and the smoke, steer for that headland, watch the drift, or we fetch up in the smother, and you drown us. That was all, and it brought them round to action. But as I sent them on towards Scylla, I told them nothing, as they could do nothing. They would have dropped their oars again, in panic, to roll for cover under the decking. Kirkus bidding against arms had slipped my mind, so I tied on my cuirass and took up two heavy spears, then made my way along to the foredeck, thinking to see her first from there, the monster of the grey rock, harboring torment for my friends. I strained my eyes upon that cliffside veiled in cloud, but nowhere could I catch sight of her. And all this time, in travail, sobbing, gaining on the current, we rode into the strait, Scylla to port, and on our starboard beam Charybdis, dire gorge of the salt sea tide. By heaven! When she vomited, all the sea was like a cauldron seething over intense fire, when the mixture suddenly heaves and rises. The shot spume soared to the landside heights and fell like rain. But when she swallowed the sea water down we saw the funnel of the maelstrom, heard the rock bellowing all around, and dark sand raged on the bottom far below. My men all blanched against the gloom, our eyes were fixed upon that yawning mouth in fear of being devoured. Then Scylla made her strike, whisking six of my best men from the ship. I happened to glance aft at ship and oarsmen and caught sight of their arms and legs, dangling high overhead. Voices came down to me in anguish, calling my name for the last time. A man surf casting on a point of rock for bass or mackerel, whipping his long rod to drop the sinker and the bait far out, will hook a fish and rip it from the surface to dangle wriggling through the air, so these were borne aloft in spasms toward the cliff. She ate them as they shrieked there, in her den, in the dire grapple, reaching still for me, and deathly pity ran me through at that sight, for the worst I ever suffered, questing. The passes of the strange sea. We rode on. The rocks were now behind, Charybdis, too, and Scylla dropped astern. Then we were coasting the noble island of the god, where grazed those cattle with wide brows, and bounteous flocks of Helios, lord of noon, who rides high heaven. From the black ship, far still at sea, I heard the lowing of the cattle winding home and sheep bleeding, and heard, too, in my heart the words of blind Tiresias of Thebes and Kirk of Aiaiaia both forbade me the island of the world's delight, the sun. So I spoke out in gloom to my companions, shipmates, grieving and weary though you are, listen, I had forewarning from Tiresias and Kirk too, both told me I must shun this island of the sun, the world's delight. Nothing but fatal trouble shall we find here. Pull away, then, and put the land astern. That strained them to the breaking point, and, cursing, Eurylocos cried out in bitterness, are you flesh and blood, Odysseus, to endure more than a man can? Do you never? Tire? God, look at you, iron is what you're made of. Here we all are, half dead with weariness, falling asleep over the oars, and you say no landing, no firm island earth where we could make a quiet supper. 
No, pull out to sea, you say, with night upon us, just as before, but wandering now, and lost. Sudden storms can rise at night and swamp ships without a trace. Where is your shelter if some stiff gale blows up from south or west, the winds that break up shipping every time when seamen flout the Lord God's will? I say do as the hour demands and go ashore before black night comes down. We'll make our supper alongside, and at dawn put out to sea. Now when the rest said I to this, I saw the power of destiny devising ill. Sharply I answered, without hesitation, Eurylocos, they are with you to a man. I am alone, outmatched. Let this whole company swear me a great oath, any herd of cattle or flock of sheep here found shall go unharmed, no one shall slaughter out of wantonness ram or heifer all. Shall be content with what the goddess Kirk put aboard. They fell at once to swearing as I ordered, and when the round of oaths had ceased, we found a half-moon bay to beach and moor the ship in, with a fresh spring nearby. All hands ashore went about skillfully getting up a meal. Then, after thirst and hunger, those besiegers were turned away, they mourned for their companions plucked from the ship by Scylla and devoured, and sleep came soft upon them as they mourned. In the small hours of the third watch, when stars that shone out in the first dusk of evening had gone down to their setting, a giant wind blew from heaven, and clouds driven by Zeus shrouded land and sea in a night of storm, so, just as dawn with finger tips of rose touched the windy world, we dragged our ship to cover in a grotto, a sea cave where nymphs had chairs of rock and sanded floors. I mustered all the crew and said, old shipmates, our stores are in the ship's hold, food and drink, the cattle here are not for our provision, or we pay dearly for it. Fierce the god is who cherishes these heifers and these sheep, Helios, and no man avoids his eye. To this my fighters nodded. Yes. But now we had a month of onshore gales, blowing day in, day out, south winds, or south by east. As long as bread and good red wine remained to keep the men up, and appease their craving, they would not touch the cattle. But in the end, when all the barley in the ship was gone, hunger drove them to scour the wild shore with angling hooks, for fishes and sea fowl, whatever fell into their hands, and lean days wore their bellies thin. The storms continued. So one day I withdrew to the interior to pray the gods in solitude, for hope that one might show me some way of salvation. Slipping away, I struck across the island to a sheltered spot, out of the driving gale. I washed my hands there, and made supplication to the gods who own Olympos, all the gods, but they, for answer, only closed my eyes under slow drops of sleep. Now on the shore Eurylocos made his insidious plea, comrades, he said, you've gone through everything, listen to what I say. All deaths are hateful to us, mortal wretches, but famine is the most pitiful, the worst end that a man can come to. Will you fight it? Come, we'll cut out the noblest of these cattle for sacrifice to the gods who own the sky, and once at home, in the old country of Ithaca, if ever that day comes, we'll build a costly temple and adorn it with every beauty for the lord of noon. But if he flares up over his heifers lost, wishing our ship destroyed, and if the gods may cause with him, why, then I say, better open your lungs to a big sea once for all than waste to skin and bones on a lonely island. Thus Eurylocos, and they murmured I, trooping away at once to round up heifers. Now, that day tranquil cattle with broad brows were grazing near, and soon the men drew up around their chosen beasts in ceremony. They plucked the leaves that shone on a tall oak, having no barley meal, to strew the victims, performed the prayers and ritual, knifed the kine and flayed each carcass, cutting thigh bones free to wrap in double folds of fat. These offerings, with strips of meat, were laid upon the fire. Then, as they had no wine, they made libation with clear spring water, broiling the entrails first, and when the bones were burnt and trite shared, they spitted the carved meat. Just then my slumber left me in a rush, my eyes opened, and I went down the seaward path. No sooner had I caught sight of our black hull than savory odors of burnt fat eddied around me, grief took hold of me, and I cried aloud, O Father Zeus and gods in bliss forever, you made me sleep away this day of mischief. O cruel drowsing, in the evil hour! Here they sat, and a great work they contrived. Lampicia in her long gown meanwhile had borne swift word to the overlord of noon, they have killed your kind. And the Lord Helios burst into angry speech amid the immortals, O Father Zeus and gods in bliss forever, punish Odysseus men. So overweening, now they have killed my 
peaceful kind, my joy at morning when I climbed the sky of stars and evening, when I bore westward from heaven. Restitution or penalty they shall pay, and pay in full, or I go down forever to light the dead men in the underworld. Then Zeus who drives the storm cloud made reply, Peace, Helios, shine on among the gods, shine over mortals in the fields of grain. Let me throw down one white, hot bolt, and make splinters of their ship in the wine-dark sea. Calypso later told me of this exchange, as she declared that Hermes had told her. Well, when I reached the sea cave and the ship I faced each man and had it out, but where could any remedy be found? There was none. The silken beeves of Helios were dead. The gods, moreover, made queer signs appear, cowhides began to crawl and beef, both raw and roasted, load like kine upon the spits. Now six full days my gallant crew could feast upon the prime beef they had marked for slaughter from Helios' herd, and Zeus, the son of Kronos, added one fine morning. All the gales had ceased, blown out, and with an offshore breeze we launched again, stepping the mast and sail, to make for the open sea. Astern of us the island coastline faded, and no land showed anywhere, but only sea and heaven, when Zeus' cronian piled a thunderhead above the ship, while gloom spread on the ocean. We held our course, but briefly. Then the squall struck whining from the west, with gale force, breaking both forestays, and the mast came toppling aft along the ship's length, so the running rigging showered into the bilge. On the after deck the mast had hit the steersman a slant blow bashing the skull in, knocking him overside, as the brave soul fled the body, like a diver. With crack on crack of thunder, Zeus let fly a bolt against the ship, a direct hit, so that she bucked, in reeking fumes of sulfur, and all the men were flung into the sea. They came up round the wreck, bobbing a while like petrels on the waves. No more seafaring homeward for these, no sweet day of return, the god had turned his face from them. I clambered fore and aft my hulk until a comber split her, keel from ribs, and the big timber floated free, the mast, too, broke away. A backstay floated dangling from it, stout rawhide rope, and I used this for lashing mast and keel together. These I straddled, riding the frightful storm. Nor had I yet seen the worst of it, for now the west wind dropped, and a southeast gale came on, one more twist of the knife, taking me north again, straight for Charybdis. All that night I drifted, and in the sunrise, sure enough, I lay off Scylla Mountain and Charybdis deep. There, as the whirlpool drank the tide, a billow tossed me, and I sprang for the great fig tree, catching on like a bat under a bough. Nowhere had I to stand, no way of climbing, the root and bowl being far below, and far above my head the branches, and their leaves, mast, overshadowing Charybdis' pool. But I clung grimly, thinking my mast and keel would come back to the surface when she spouted. And ah! How long, with what desire, I waited. Till at the twilight hour, when one who hears and judges pleas in the marketplace all day between contentious men, goes home. To supper, the long poles at last reared from the sea. Now I let go with hands and feet, plunging straight into the foam beside the timbers, pulled astride, and rode hard with my hands to pass by Scylla. Never could I have passed her had not the father of gods and men, this time, kept me from her eyes. Once through the strait, nine days I drifted in the open sea before I made shore, buoyed up by the gods, upon O.G. Igia Isle. The dangerous nymph Calypso lives and sings there, in her beauty, and she received me, loved me. But why tell the same tale that I told last night in hall to you and to your lady? Those adventures made a long evening, and I do not hold with tiresome repetition of a story.